Thanks for joining us today. Today we're going to be continuing our look at the Gospel of Mark, really just diving in uh, to the life of Jesus, what it means to be with Him, and how that shapes our life. And today we're picking up right where we left off last week in the midst of Mark 2, Pastor Jason looking at two interactions, confrontations uh, Jesus has with the religious leader. And we're going to look at three more right in a row. And uh, today we're going to be looking at what is often a very confusing passage uh, in Jesus' life and ministry, one that for a large portion of my life I would look at and say, I have no idea what that means, and just move on to the next one. Uh, but it, the reason for that, and the reason a lot of people end up there, is because this passage in particular is deeply, deeply rooted in religious tradition, in history, in culture, in religion. And to really understand it and Jesus' response, we have to understand what's going on all around them. Uh, and so for that to happen, uh, we have to use a hermeneutical principle. And so you've probably seen this before if you've been at Family Church for, for a while now. Uh, it's something that is deeply important. It comes from grasping God's word, uh, this like college level book about how do we interpret the Bible. And this is valuable not just for us as pastors and preparing sermons, but for anybody studying the Bible at any time. And there's five main principles that we really wanted to cover as a teaching team to share with you, one for you in your own study. But really, how do we arrive at, how do we deal with a passage like today? And so these five principle steps are this. The first one, grasping the text in their town, that there is, uh, the author has written this book with an intended audience, and there's an assumption that they would know what was going on because of their history and their culture, their language, the situation going on around them, the covenant that they exist in, all of this. So you begin by looking at a, a difficult passage, or really any passage in general, just looking at everything that's going on, making observations. And one once we have that, we move to the second step, uh, measuring the width of the river. That's really taking a look at how significant are the differences between the original audience and us today. We're now 2,000, almost 2,000 years uh, f away from the passage that we're going to look at today. And there's a lot of differences. And sometimes these differences cause a lot of confusion. Sometimes they don't today in particular uh, really shape our understanding of the passage today. Once we've done all that, we can go ahead, we can start interpreting this passage, and we've crossed the principalizing bridge. This is is where we identify what is the timeless God-ordained principle in the text, right? And I say identify because we're not creating principles. We're identifying what is already there. And then once we have this principle, we take it, we consult the biblical map. This is like when you're in uh, algebra and your teacher's like, show your work, and then you have to go back and prove it by, by kind of doing it in reverse. This is taking that, that principle that you have identified, looking at the rest of Scripture, and saying, does this come in conflict? Is this reinforced somewhere else in the Bible? And then if it, it does come in conflict, then we have to then we have to go back. We have to identify, did we identify the principle incorrectly? Is our understanding of the rest of Scripture incorrect? What's going on? That's a stopping point and a really evaluating point and really going back to the beginning. If we are all good, if it holds up to the rest of the Bible, we have our principle and we move to step five, really taking that principle. How does that work in our own town? How does that apply to my life today, because that's the idea, taking a principle, not just knowing them, but then applying them. So with that in mind, hopefully that helps you as you uh, study the Bible yourself, but also really getting an idea, how are we going to approach today's passage? And so we're looking at, starting in Mark 2, 18, right? Another conversation Jesus is having, and it starts off, uh, verse 18, now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and disciples of the Pharisee fast, but your disciples do not fast? Now, a lot of scholars believe that this is possibly, not for sure, but possibly uh, directly happening right after last week's passage. They're all feasting. Uh, this is just kind of the general way in which the, Jesus and his disciples are living. They're feasting. They're joyous. Everything seems to be going well. And some people are taking notice and they're asking Jesus, hey, why aren't you fasting? The Pharisees fast. John the Baptist and his disciples fast. You guys, you don't seem to be fasting. Why are you not participating in this practice? 
And so they're contrasting him against the Pharisees, a group that was uh, looked down upon Jesus and John's disciples and John himself who were friendly with Jesus, right? This isn't an issue with the Pharisees. This is a practice that people you agree with are practicing. Why, Jesus, are you guys not practicing this? And to understand this question, we have to understand the traditions and the law at the time. They existed under the Mosaic law, the old covenant. And in the Mosaic law, there was one day a year in which all Jews were to fast. And it was the day of atonement, uh, what would often commonly be called now Yom Kippur. Uh, and this was a day of repentance, turning back to the Lord. There were sacrifices. They were to, as an entire people group, afflict themselves, which would mean abstaining from a lot of things, particularly fasting from food and water. But this wasn't the issue at hand. Right, Jesus, what we know of them, he was a devout Jew. He came to fulfill the law and not to break it. He would have participated in the Day of Atonement. He would have fasted on that day. This had to do with what was now called the rabbinical law, something that was added on top of the Mosaic law. The Pharisees, the rabbis at the time, had created all these extra rules and regulations and practices uh, for a lot of reasons, one of them just to keep them far away from breaking the actual law. And one of the practices they had, they had instituted was a twice weekly uh, fasting. Monday and Thursday, people were to fast. And this was done not for the same reason the Day of Atonement fast existed, but an act of piety. It was this holy religious act, right, that was, that was just shrouded in sorrow. The idea was just expressing this sorrow for the state of Israel who had turned away from God. And it was just this, 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 it, like it's just sorrow, it's just grieving. And it would be in conjunction with prayer. Fasting has always been gone hand in hand with prayer. And not only that, they would wear sackcloth, they would put ashes on themselves. Just this sorrowful moment. In fact, <clears throat> they actually had some other beliefs around this as well. Some of the Pharisees at the time, we know from recorded history, they believed that doing this uh, twice a week fast would actually hasten the arrival of the Messiah. And then the people are looking to Jesus. This was, a, this was a practice that was held in high esteem. They're looking to Jesus as a rabbi and saying, why do you and your disciples not participate in this fast? And Jesus gives them an answer that is even more confusing than the question itself. He responds, and Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast in that day. He answers them a question about fasting and he goes straight to talking now about fastings and weddings. And this again has to do wholly with the culture, the religion, the tradition at the time. He was responding to them in a way that they would have immediately understood and identified. He starts talking about weddings because this twice weekly fast had some exceptions to it. One of those exceptions had to do with weddings. The rabbis, they were, they were pointing to, hey, you should fast twice a week, uh, participate in the sorrowful moment, except when it comes in conflict, what should be joyous moments. And weddings were to be joyous moments, events. They were these, this, this, this thing they viewed highly, this God-ordained union between man and woman under God amidst God's people. It was to be this big, sometimes days-long celebration, and it was to be marked by joy. And they themselves said, hey, you know what? Uh, this, this practice, this sorrowful practice is important, but sorrow has no place in a joyful event like weddings. And so if there's a wedding, you don't fast. You're joyful. You're excited. You're participating in your, you're just having this grand time. They would have understood exactly what Jesus was saying. He said, you don't bring sorrow. You don't bring fasting to the wedding. But why is he talking about wedding? There's no wedding happening today. He's connecting the idea of the wedding and the bridegroom to himself. He, an analogy he would often use that he was the bridegroom to the nation of Israel and ultimately now to the church. Right? He's pointing to himself as the Messiah and he even points to, this is the very first time he points to the idea that, hey, there will come a time when the bridegroom, when the Messiah is gone, the time between his death and resurrection, then it's time for sorrow. But while Jesus is present, there shouldn't be sorrow, there should be joy. What, the, what they were waiting for, what they, they desired at the core of their being, the Pharisees, John the Baptist, all of them was for the Messiah to arrive, for God to return to them. 
And it had happened. And he's saying, what, where's, why would you be sorrowful? What you desire is here. This is a time for joy. And the first thing we see is that Jesus brings joy. Jesus brings joy. God, right, they were wanting the people to turn back to God and instead God came to them. He said, be joyful. What you have desired is here. Be joyful. And it was true for them and it's true for us today. What Jesus brings for us amongst many things, it's not the only thing, he brings us joy. He brings us joy. He is the answer to the deepest problem that each and every one of us had, the separation from God. He is the solution to the sin issue. He brings us joy. Are you living in the joy that Jesus has for you? Are you delighting in the fact that God has come to earth, he has died for you, he has redeemed for you, and not only that, but now he has left. Jesus says, when he leaves, the Father will send the Holy Spirit. Each and every one of you, if you're sitting here today and you are in Jesus, the Holy Spirit indwells you. Jesus, excuse me, God is in you. He has made you his temple. That should bring us joy that we have the Holy Spirit within us. In fact, what scripture says is the fruit of the Spirit residing within us is joy. And when you look at the New Testament, one that they talk about the main characteristics of followers of Christ is love and joy. Are you experiencing this joy? It should be how we live and how what the people around us see. And when I talk about joy, I want to be really clear because the English language kind of butchers the idea of joy because we just look at joy like it's this extra step of happiness. It's like double plus happiness or, you know, it's, we have the picture of joy. It's just that person, that cheerleader always riling us up, super happy and peppy all the time, really just annoying. That's not joy, right? Joy does have an emotional aspect and connection to happiness, but it goes so much deeper than that. It's the contentment in the face of everything, all of, all of life's difficulties. It's the, the, the hope that is found only in Christ. It's this deep, deep uh, thing that touches our soul and changes how we live. Are you experiencing the joy that Jesus brings? And I, I, I ask that because when I look around, I don't, I don't know that we fully do. I, do. I don't think it's true that we don't have any joy, but are we really living in the joy that Jesus has for us? There's a common, a common statement that I hear time and time again, and actually, I'm as guilty as anyone of saying it. Right? It's this, 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 this idea that we say somewhere along those lines of, hey, you know what, that today is just, the world's just a terrible, terrible mess. And you know what, I just, I cannot wait. I cannot wait till I am reunited in heaven with God. Then everything will be perfect. And right, I, I know this is a really complicated statement. There's a lot to it. It's complex. The reality is that's true. We do have a hope in an an eternal future with God and it's going to be perfect. It's going to be unimaginable and it's great. But that's not all we have is a future in heaven. Jesus didn't come solely so that we could have an eternal future. He came for the present. He was bringing the kingdom of God to earth. He was changing everything. He came not just for our future, but for our today. When Jesus in his ministry, he he talked very little about heaven or hell. What he was commonly talking about is how his arrival, how his death and resurrection, how the gospel was going to shape our lives. That he was changing our present, not just our future. Are you living in the joy of what Jesus has accomplished in your life? Are you living in the joy that is available by abiding in the Holy Spirit? Is joy a marker characteristic of your life? He goes on from this and he actually kind of just kind of nails it home. And he actually goes forward and he now goes to two, two parables that re, really reinforce this that again are kind of confusing because uh, culturally they just don't carry much significance for us. They're not a commonplace part of our life, but for the people at the time, they would have immediately understood his references. The first, he says, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth and an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. 
Right, he, he talks to what, what I think a lot of us understand, although it seems to be coming kind of this, this idea from a bygone era. Uh, I remember as a child, I would go to the store for clothes shopping, which was one of my absolute least favorite things to do. And particularly when you're going for pants, I don't, I don't really, I don't, I don't see us having to do this anymore. But at least 30 years ago, you would go and look for clothes and you would, per, when you look at pants, you would like have to kind of guess what size do I really have to buy? Because you might have known your size, but you had to get like a size or maybe two bigger than you actually wore because the understanding was you would take it home, you'd run it through the wash, and it would shrink maybe one wash, two, three, four cycles until it finally got to the actually size you were going to be stuck with. And so we would buy the clothes, we would bring them home, and they would shrink, right? And nowadays, everything, or most everything, comes pre-shrunk, not something we really have to do, but the understanding we have. And so he's saying this, this shrunk clothes, these clothes that have been shrunk, because when they would wash, the same thing would happen. You wouldn't take and get a tear in it and then take and patch it. And I know that's, again, something we don't do. Who anymore patches their clothes? Like, we don't have to do that anymore. Everything's disposable. These pants were like six... 50 at Costco. As soon as they get a hold of them, they're in the trash and I'm getting a new $6.50 set of, of pants, right? We don't patch anything, but they would patch their clothes continually. Things weren't so disposable back then. And they said, hey, Jesus says, you wouldn't take an old shrunken piece of cloth and then take a new brand new cloth, unshrunken, and sew it to that clothes. If you did that, when you wash it, that new piece is going to shrink. It's going to tear out. It's going to make things worse. Only a fool would try to meld the old with the new. He goes on, he gives a second one, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. Again, I think something that we probably understand, uh, but is really not familiar with us. He's talking about the process of making wine. And for them at the time, uh, something that we don't really do, at least in the Western world, to make wine, they would put it into wineskins, some kind of pouch maybe made of... Uh, 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 something like leather and they would sew it all up and then they would put the fresh juice into the wine skin you know, with, along with yeast. And so what would happen is as this wine begins to ferment, the sugars in the wine change into alcohol and CO2. And so this, this off-gassing occurs inside of this sealed wine skin. And as it does that, right, gas expands. So the wine skin itself would have to expand. And if it's a new wineskin, that, that leather or whatever cloth they're using, it has some amount of elasticity. It can expand. But he says, eventually, right, a wineskin is going to lose its elasticity. So you, if you were to take that wineskin and put fresh juice into it to turn it into wine, that off-gassing, that CO2, it's going to burst the wineskin. It can't expand. You're going to have ruined wine. You're going to have a ruined wineskin. Everything's bad. Only a fool would do that. No one would try to make wine inside of an old wineskin. You cannot mesh the old with the new. And that's what he's pointing to. The time for sorrow has gone. The time for joy has arisen. He's really pointing to something even deeper than that. He's ushering in a new covenant. The law is passing. Jesus is now instituting a new covenant of grace as he fulfills it. Everything's changing. And the old and the new don't work together. He'll go on now. He's going to go to what is his fourth confrontation with the Pharisees. It says, one Sabbath, he was going through the grain field, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? So the understanding of this passage is, is Jesus and his disciples, they're out. They've been working hard. What we'll see actually, I believe it's next week, is they're working so hard, this ministry that Jesus now had, performing miracles and teaching. They're often not even eating, right? And, and the people are recognizing it. And so they're likely heading back from this, this work that they're doing. They're walking alongside a grain field or maybe through the grain field along the road. And, and the disciples, they're hungry. And the analogy he's going to use, it makes clear, they're not just just like, hey, uh, I missed my mid-morning snack and, it's, uh, and, and I need something before lunchtime. Like, they're famished. They're hungry. They're desperate for food. Uh, they're not at the point of death, but they are. They need some sustenance. And so the, the disciples start plucking the heads of grain and they roll it in their hand and they eat it. This is like the most primitive form of food. This is not a meal. This is like they just need sustenance. And the Pharisees 
We don't know if they saw them or somebody makes them aware of this, whatever the reason. They approach Jesus and they're like, hey, why, why, Rabbi, are you allowing your disciples to break our most important law? The Sabbath had become the most important part of all of Judaism. It was their marker, marker day that separated from all the nations when they would rest and everybody else would work. It was the pinnacle of their law. You were not to break the Sabbath. And to be clear, the question they're asking, the, the, the law that they're breaking doesn't have to do with the disciples stealing. Some people believe that's what was happening. Uh, the law, God himself provided for people in need. They, that they were commanded by God to leave certain parts of the field for people to be able to walk through and take some amount of food to provide for their immediate need. They weren't supposed to come in and take a sickle to it. This wasn't harvesting somebody else, but simply being able to eat some amount of food for the people in need. And so here's Jesus' disciples there in need. That's the, not the problem. The problem is no one is supposed to work on the Sabbath. It's very, very clear. The the rules and regulations of the Sabbath are kind of vague, but everybody understood work is not to be done. And they had decided, you know what, that picking up the grain off the top constituted work. And they were serious about this. The Pharisees at the time, they had taken, they had created 39 specific rules and regulations about what constituted work on the Sabbath, they were like adamant, we're not going to break this law. No one should break this law. They, and then they, they got real specific. Like work, they had defined, if you carried something in your arms on the Sabbath, that was work. If you carried something on your ear, or on your back, you were good to go. That was work. They got down to the nitty gritty details. But when they looked at or heard about the disciples, they said, that is harvesting. That is work. They have broken the law, which requires them to be put to death. Why, Jesus, are your disciples, and maybe Jesus himself, why is this happening? And Jesus is going to respond. He says to them, have you never read what David did? Jesus goes directly to who would be one of the most, if not the most esteemed men in all of Jewish history and in the scriptures. He goes straight to him, a man that is held in such high regard by the Jewish people. And he says this statement that today we read that seems kind of like sassy and kind of a little bit rude. This was a common idiom at the time that rabbis would use with one another as the discussion discussing uh, the law and scripture, uh, and they would often just fire questions back and forth. There's no disrespect intended in this statement. He says, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus points directly to a story that really formed an understanding that the the Pharisees, the rabbis at the time, had of, of the law. He actually doesn't even point to a Sabbath event. He just points to an event of David breaking, or at least appearing to break, the letter of the law where he goes and he and his men, as they're fleeing from Saul, in this moment of need, they go, they eat the bread that is only specifically by the Mosaic law for, <clears throat> for the priests. And the understanding, what the Pharisees would have understood, what they agreed with was, you know what? Yes, the law exists, but there is always provision in the law for man's need. The law was not meant to bind them, to trap people, to punish them. There was always provision for need. God was a gracious, compassionate God. And right, Jesus goes straight to it. He adds on to that. He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath wasn't just a rule that was supposed to crush people. It wasn't supposed to put them down. It wasn't supposed to withhold them from their need. The Sabbath and the rest of the law was a gift It was a gift from God for his people. Yes, there were regulations in them, but all of them pointed to these boundaries that were for humans flourishing. The Sabbath in particular, it was a gracious gift from God and God wasn't concerned about using the law to say, hey, you know what, you're starving, but you can't eat. It wasn't about checking a box. That was never God's intent. That was their understanding and what Jesus pointed to. You, you yourselves, Pharisees, understand need has always, always been allowed in the law. That's all my men were doing, providing for their immediate need. 
And then he kind of gives them, he, he finishes up this argument, this disagreement, whatever you want to call it, with this kind of just this mic drop moment. He says, so the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Right? He just ends the conversation right there. This is an incredibly powerful statement. He, he uses his messianic title, which in and of itself is a divine title. But then he says it really repeats it. The, Lord, I, the Son of Man, Jesus, is Lord even of the Sabbath. He, he claims his divinity. He says, you know what? I get to decide the Sabbath rules. I'm the Sabbath, the master of the Sabbath, right? In essence, he says, uh, most of you today listening, right, you are parents, whether your kids are grown or not. Uh, If not, right, you've all been children at some point, so you can relate to this. You know that time you're parenting your children and they're doing something they're not supposed to do and you tell them to knock it off, you tell them not to do something or to do something, whatever it may be, and they ask the question that nobody ever wants to hear, why? Why? And this question really only has two reasons for it. The first is actually uh, rooted in something good, right? Kids are, kids want to know. They want to understand the way the world works. They're asking why. Hey, why, why can't I do this? They really want to understand why should I not do what appears to be good or fun. And then on the other hand, or maybe in conjunction with this, they're asking why because they just want to throw you off their game off your game. They want to they wanna get into an argument because if they get you onto an argument, you might waste your time and then forget about what you even started on. It doesn't really matter because what happens when they ask why, I think we've all been there at some point, we just say, because I said so. Because I said so. And when we say that, right, some of that's good, right? They should respect authority. Uh, they should honor their parents. But ultimately, when I say that, there's, a, there's always a part of me that's just like, I just don't want to have this conversation anymore. I just want to be comfortable. I just want some peace and quiet. Do it because I said it and, and just keep your mouth shut. And Jesus, in essence, is kind of saying the same thing because I said so. And he's not doing it for that selfish reason that comes out of us. He's doing it because he actually has authority, he just says. He said, this is the proper understanding of the Sabbath and the law because I said so, because Jesus is God. He gets to define their understanding of the Sabbath. The rabbis don't get to debate him on this. He created the Sabbath. He, he, he has the full understanding of the Sabbath. He knows why it's created. He knows all the exceptions. This conversation is over because Jesus is God. And it's, it's something that, that we have been pointing to these, these first couple of chapters time and time again. Jesus keeps coming back to this truth that he is in fact God. And, there, and, and there's so much that goes into that because it comes with uh, the understanding that he is the ultimate. He's the ultimate authority. He's the ultimate source of truth. He's the ultimate provider. He is the ultimate example of love. He is the, on and on and you can go anything that's good. Jesus, God is the ultimate of that. And a question I have out of that, a question I've really been wrestling with is do I really believe that? Do I really believe that Jesus is God? And I think it's a question we all have to ask ourselves. Do I believe, do you believe that Jesus is God? And I'm guessing if you're a follower of Christ here today, you just went to the immediate answer like, yes, like that's a core tenet of our belief. Jesus exists as a tr- is part of the Trinity. He is God in the flesh. But when we say believe, we're not just talking about intellectually. We're talking about belief that affects every aspect of our life. When I ask myself, do I believe Jesus is God? That belief should be so evident in my life that it shapes how I think and how I live. Do I believe, do you believe that Jesus is God? Because if that is true, if that is true, how I live should look drastically different. It should shape all aspects of my life. If Jesus is God, that means he's the ultimate authority in my life. And when I'm going through my life trying to figure things out, trying to wrestle what's right and wrong or what should I do here, you know who has the answer? It's not me or not some book I can go study, right? The ultimate authority and that needs to be filtered through God, through Jesus. He is the one that we should look to first. And yes, the Bible doesn't cover every last topic, but if it does, that should be our understanding. If Jesus is truly God, if he's the ultimate authority, it should change how we pray. 
We were just talking about this actually this week in my life group. If I really believe Jesus is who he says he is and he says the things he says are true, it would change how I would pray. I would come to him with everything. I would come to him with everything. I would come for him with the unreasonable ideas that I believe are aligned with it. I would tell him the, 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 the desires of my heart, not the desires of my flesh, but the desires of my heart and the heart that I am, is aligned with him. I would bring those to him at all times. I wouldn't withhold. I would just come to him like the good creator that he is. If Jesus is God, it would change how I treated everyone. It would shape how I interact with my kids, how I treat them, how I discipline them. If Jesus is who he says, if he's God, when I go to discipline my God, my desire wouldn't be for their behavior modification. It would be for something much, much deeper than that. It would be so that they have heart transformation, so that they look to God for all things, that they don't have just the actions that please me, but a heart that is chasing after Jesus. If, if I truly believe Jesus is God, how I loved and, and lived with my wife would change. There are times, right, when even though I don't know I'm doing it right, what I'm doing with my wife, I'm trying to get what I desire. And instead, if I believe Jesus was God and he was changing me to look like him, that he was the ultimate authority, that he was the ultimate example, right? My relationship with my wife would time and time always be me living sacrificially, me loving her like Christ loved the church, laying down my life for her, uh, enabling her, her flourishing under him. If we truly believe this, everything about our lives would change. And so when I ask that, I'm not asking an intellectual question, do you believe Jesus is God? Although it has to start there. But really, do you believe it in such a way that it is changing you daily, moment to moment, that Jesus being God is shaping everything in your life? There's another aspect of this I want to cover real quick. And it, it's kind of just, uh, it's just, I think it's important because of the culture we live in that Jesus is God because it's, it's an idea that's coming under attack increasingly. And it's, it's really prevalent in the younger generations, millennials, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, right? The idea of Jesus actually existing is, is, is becoming really commonplace. There's really overwhelming evidence outside, extra biblical evidence that Jesus actually, there was a man in first century Rome who had a ministry whose name was Jesus, right? The history books point to this being true. The question isn't whether Jesus actually walked the earth. The question is this, is Jesus God? And what I hear increasingly, and this is important as we disciple uh, non-believers around this, as we're helping them wrestle with Jesus, this question is paramount. Is Jesus God? Because what I hear more and more is this idea, yeah, Jesus was just a really wise guy, right? He was really knowledgeable. He should be another guy that we look to like Buddha or some of the philosophers on and on and on. He's just another way to some really uh, good knowledge, a good way of living. But Jesus was very clear in his actions, in his teachings, that he wasn't just a good source of knowledge. He was the ultimate source of knowledge because he is God. It was enmeshed in what he was teaching and saying. You can't separate the two. I went actually back and took a really quick look at the first two chapters because that's where we're at, the end of the second chapters. There are seven distinct times now Jesus has made claims to his divinity. You can't separate Jesus' teachings from the fact that he believed his God. So you're only really left with two choices. Either Jesus is who he says he is. He is God. He, his teachings have value, not because they're just really good ideas, but because they're the ultimate, come from the ultimate source of truth or the other options that Jesus is a lunatic. He's a guy going around telling everybody, like he will not stop talking about it. He tells everybody, hey, I'm God in the flesh. There's no room in the gospel for Jesus is just really wise. You have to decide who is Jesus. Is he God, who he says he is, or is he just a madman? And if he's, if, if he's a madman, he's not worth listening to. I don't know about you, but when I go around looking for knowledge or wisdom, I'm very careful about the sources I take wisdom from. If somebody's going to be on the street claiming they're God, they're just not somebody I'm going to go to for knowledge. They may, they're worthy of love. They are worth caring for. But just we, 
we would be right. Everybody would claim you're right to look at the source of your knowledge. We're going to look at the last interaction now. Again, Jesus, he entered the synagogue and a man was there with a withered hand and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. So here we are, Jesus enters on the Sabbath day. He enters the synagogue and there's a man there with a withered hand. The word here in Greek implies this is not like a congenital defect. He's not born this way. This is from disease or an injury. And this would have been life-changing for this man. In a, in a world that doesn't have office jobs, right? This impacts his ability to do manual labor. This would have been, right, impacted every aspect of his life. And Jesus is there. He sees them. And what's also happening is the Pharisees, they're watching Jesus. This word watch isn't just like, hey, they're watching him this moment. This is, this is what they're doing at all times. They are now focused on Jesus. And they see Jesus. They see this man and they have a belief. They believe Jesus is going to heal this guy. They're watching to see not whether he can anymore, but will he heal this man? And in particular, will he heal him on the Sabbath? And Jesus says to the man with the withered man, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? He asked them the most simple question. Is it lawful on the Sabbath? Is it good? Are you to do good or evil? Are you to save or kill? He cuts through all of their understanding of the law, what is lawful, what's not lawful. And they had made this unlawful. They, they viewed, right, he, he kind of pointed to it last time he confronted them, right? They had an understanding need could be met, but it was limited to immediate need. This guy's injury was bad. He needed healing, but he didn't need healing today. It could wait for tomorrow. And Jesus says, we're just going to cut through all of that. What's lawful, good or evil, life or death? And it says, but they were silent. They won't answer Jesus. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. Jesus looks at them. They won't even answer the most simple question. They know the answer but they won't answer. He, and he's angry. We see his emotions. One of the few times we see he's angry and it's not malicious. It's just this, this indignation and he's grieving. He's brokenhearted because these men who are supposed to be like God's representative on earth, they won't even answer the most simple of questions. They're so concerned with accusing Jesus. They're so concerned with checking the boxes when he asks them about what's the heart behind all the law. They won't say a thing. And they immediately leave and they go to their enemies. The Pharisees and Herodians, they're opposed. They go to them to destroy him. This isn't destroy his career as a rabbi. This is to kill him. Right to the heart of the question Jesus is answering. And the last thing we see is Jesus desires your heart. He's asking this question not to reveal whether they can follow the, the law to the letter, not with that they can check the boxes. He wants to know what's their heart. Because the heart of God is to do good. The heart of God is to care for his people, to meet their need. And they've missed it. They've missed it. Their heart, what we see, what they do, immediately after that, what he, what he even asks in the question. He's asking, can he do good? Can he save this man's life? Even though it's not save in the, in the immediate sense of the word. In their heart, they're already plotting to kill him. And that's what they go do that very same day. They go to have him killed. And all of it, Jesus is pointing to the idea that yes, he desires, God desires our obedience, but far, far beyond that, he desires our heart. Does Jesus have your heart? I'm gonna go ahead and release the campus pastors. I love you guys. Have a great day.